Many people ask me in the comments why I did not include Russia in my demographic analysis. I always knew I wanted to do a separate video about Russian demographics, since they are unique in many ways. Not because the Russian demographic profile is significantly different than the rest of the Eastern European, especially post-Soviet, states. On the contrary, Russian population pyramid is very similar to that of other Eastern European post-Soviet countries, especially Ukraine and Belarus, but also the Baltic states. Actually, the population pyramid of Eastern Europe as a whole is significantly similar to the Russian population pyramid, since Russia is by far the most populous country classified as Eastern Europe by the United Nations. But Russia is significantly different in one crucial aspect. Russia is not a nation state, like most of the other post-communist countries. Not even a nation state with a significant ethnic minority, like Romania or Slovakia. Russia is a multinational empire. It is the last remnant of the European imperial era. While Russia never had overseas colonial empire, like the Western European nations, it did expand over the whole northern Eurasian landmass from the 15th century on, and it firmly established its power in the Eurasian space before also becoming great European power in the 18th century. Russia is thus a multinational and multicultural state, but in a fundamentally different way than the Western European states. While in Western Europe, multiculturalism is a recent development caused almost completely by immigration, sometimes from the lands of the former colonial empires, sometimes not, in Russia, the multicultural and multi-ethnic character of the federation is caused by the conquest and annexation of the lands inhabited by native populations populations different from the Slavic Russians. A variety of Turkic nations, like the Tatars, Caucasian nations, like the Chechens and the Dagestanis, or Mongolian peoples, like the Buryats, are just some of the 193 ethnic groups living in the Russian Federation. But, as I will explore later in the video, Immigration from the former Soviet republics of Central Asia and the Caucasus is also increasingly contributing to changes in the demographic profile of Russia. Like almost every empire, the Russian Empire has clearly defined imperial nation, the Eastern Slavic ethnic group called Russians. Sure, members of other ethnic groups can, today as well as in the past, ascend through the ranks of the imperial bureaucracy and hold prestigious positions within the administration. That was the case in many multinational empires throughout history, such as the Ottoman Empire. And it is still the case in Russia today, as we can demonstrate in the example of Sergei Shoigu, the Russian minister of defense that is of Tuvan descent after his father. But the historical mission of the Russian state, in the minds of its ruling class, is the protection of interests and the greatness of the Russian people. That is clearly observable in the approach of the Russian ruling class towards the current invasion of Ukraine. Vladimir Putin continues to verbally strip the status of full-fledged nation from Ukrainians and stresses the belonging of Ukrainians to the greater Russian nation. Ukrainians can aspire to be a subcategory of Russians, but they are certainly not their own nation. The wish to integrate Ukraine into Russia is, according to many Kremlin insiders, motivated also by the wish to expand the demographic strength of the Russian ethnic Slavic core by tens of millions of Ukrainians, since Vladimir Putin sees a large population as a prerequisite of a superpower status on par with the United States and China. Even though it is delusional, since Russia lacks the economic and innovative strength of the named countries. Such approaches towards the war are supported by the practices like the abduction of Ukrainian children to Russia for cultural russification, even though the extent of this practice is contested, or the mobilization practices of the Russian military that prefers to mobilize the ethnic minority populations from the poor peripheries first, before mobilizing the ethnic Russians from the Slavic heartlands. This practice is surely also motivated by the wish not to create discontent among the Russian middle classes in large cities, but likely also by ethnic considerations. Ethnic minorities are treated as cannon fodder and their lives are perceived as less worthy than those of ethnic Russians, even though the lives of the ethnic Russians are still not treated as particularly valuable compared to many other parts of the world. In the view of the Russian elite, if there are high combat losses among the ethnic minority populations fighting in Ukraine, it will at least slow the retreat of the Russian ethnic majority within the Russian Federation, so to speak. The point of view from which the Russian elite perceives these demographic issues is thus fundamentally different from the discussions about such issues in the West. In the Western discourse, demographics are usually debated as a technical matter connected to the labor force, consumption, 
and other economic parameters. When you dig deeper, cultural aspects connected to migration and ethnic change are sometimes brought up. But in Russia, there is also great consideration given to demographics from the military point of view. The demographic angle is crucial if you plan to wage an offensive war since you need adequate manpower. Vladimir Putin is aware of this and the demographic decline of the Russian Federation, especially its Slavic core, is very concerning for him. What is fascinating about the rise and fall of the Soviet Union in the 20th century is that you can clearly see the demography underpinning the tale of the communist superpower. At the beginning of the 20th century, Russia was undergoing the rapid growth phase of the demographic transition. In the late Tsarist period, Russian women still had around 6 or 7 children on average, and the fall in infant mortality meant that the population was booming. Moreover, while the ethnically Russian and other Eastern Slavic Western parts of the country were in the rapid growth phase of the demographic transition, most of the ethnic minorities in the Caucasus, Central Asia and the Far East were still in the stage before the infant mortality fell and caused rapid population growth. This allowed Russia and the Soviet Union to roll like a steamroller over the incredibly bloody first half of the 20th century, since the supply of fresh workers, soldiers and bodies never dried up. World wars, civil war, great terror, famine, all historical events that took a hardly believable human toll on the population in tens of millions. But even after all this horror took place, the Russian and Soviet populations still managed to almost double throughout the first half of the 20th century, from 155 million in 1897 to nearly a quarter of a billion in 1970, while also maintaining a clear majority of the Eastern Slavic ethnicities within the Soviet Empire. These Eastern Slavic populations were, willingly and unwillingly, sent to the peripheral areas to help with economic development and culturally russified the regions. This demographic underpinning of geopolitical success is also not unique to the Russians. Generally, if a country connects its population rapid growth phase with industrialization and overall economic and technological progress, it almost guarantees its geopolitical ascendance. Britain leading the way in industrialization and the demographic transition, was experiencing its most rapid population growth from the end of the 18th century to the 19th century. It is no coincidence that it also managed to create the most powerful empire in the world at that time and populate several continents, like the North America and Australia, while doing so. After that, in the second half of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century, Germany was undergoing its rapid population growth period. And it also strived for European hegemony when almost all the remaining European great powers and the United States had to gang up on Germany twice to stop its expansion. And in the first half of the 20th century, Russia became one of the two world superpowers. This process is also not constrained to the West or even Europe. The rise of Japan, China and the other Asian tigers was underpinned by rapid population growth in all the mentioned cases. That is not to propel some demographic determinism, since most of the countries in the world either went through the demographic transition or is undergoing it now without becoming economic and military powerhouses. Only the countries that hit the sweet spot of industrializing and then experiencing demographic momentum for long enough to use their growing and young populations to fuel their industry, innovation and military conquest have reached this pinnacle. Most countries worldwide experience demographic transition and rapid population growth without sufficient overall technological progress to make them great powers for example, Nigeria or Pakistan. In those cases, the rapid population growth is often a recipe for significant problems connected to crushing poverty and potential famine. But back to Russia. After the Second World War, the fertility rate of the USSR continued to drop until it reached the replacement level during the 1970s. The population was still growing significantly because of the demographic momentum, a phenomenon that occurs when the fertility is decreasing, but there are many women in childbearing age because of the high fertility of the previous generation. Generations. Nevertheless, the Eastern Slavic demographic heartland was running out of steam. That was only magnified by the infant mortality rates dropping, thus creating significant population growth in the peripheral ethnically non-Russian parts of the USSR. In the late 1950s, fewer than 60 babies per thousand were dying in Russia, while it was triple this rate in peripheral regions like the Tajikistan or the Caucasus. But as infant mortality was dropping fast in the ethnically predominantly non-Russian regions, 
the women in these regions also maintained significantly higher fertility rates, usually at least double that of those in ethnically Russian regions. That resulted in a profound shift in the ethnic makeup within the Soviet Union. Between 1959 and 1957, the Russian population outside of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, the core Soviet Republic that later became the Russian Federation, fell from 18% to 14%. And the decline was just gathering pace. The republics of the Soviet Union, with Muslim majority, saw their population rise from 13% in 1959 to 20% in 1989. Soviet projections showed Russian ethnicity being less than a third of the total population of the Soviet Union by the middle of the 21st century. That was also magnified by the failure to Russify the non-Russian regions by a steady inflow of ethnic Russians towards the peripheries, especially those deemed as agriculturally productive. In the late stages of the Union, it was common for Soviet women to undergo six or seven abortions during their lifetimes since it was the most common form of contraception. Soviet leadership also felt the consequences of the demographic retreat in the Afghan military campaign in the 1980s, where the world could see that trying to subject a country with mountainous terrain inhabited by very competent natives, with the average age of the population being 16 years, meaning huge supply of new young men of military age, is very difficult even with much larger population and vast technological superiority. There, the Soviet establishment was facing a shortage of ethnically Russian recruits since people were much less willing to send their sons to war in some faraway land when they have two children and not five. And there was also the suspicion of lower loyalty of the recruits from the demographically more dynamic parts of the state, which were mostly Muslim and often also culturally relatively close to the Afghanis, in the case of Central Asian populations. The Soviet military was facing increasing troubles with integrating the Central Asian populations. And in the later stages of the existence of the Soviet Union, up to three quarters of the Central Asian recruits could not speak Russian. Even though there was a nominal communist party doctrine that perceived all ethnic groups as equal, in the case of perpetuating the Soviet state, which was just a continuation of Russian imperialism in a different package, the Soviet leadership was aware that some were more equal than others. Eastern Slavic workers were more productive than the workers from the peripheral regions, since the Eastern Slavic populations were more educated and comprised a clear majority in the industrial heartlands of the Union. In many ways, these processes can be seen as a parallel to the struggle of the Western Europeans to maintain their overseas colonies despite massive population growth in these lands, which were becoming to far outstrip the populations of the imperial nations in Europe. While it is, of course, very reductive to prescribe the fall of the Soviet Union to these demographic dynamics, it is impossible to study its development without sufficiently diving into them. While many people advocating for socialism argue with the rapid economic growth of the Soviet Union in the first decades of its existence, this growth was fueled by a rapid increase in the number of workers. When the supply of workers dried up, the growth became anemic and the whole system began to crumble. It shows that such a massively inefficient economic system as the one of the Soviet Union cannot survive the reduction in the input of laborers, especially of the most educated and qualified ones. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the newly established Russian Federation entered a period of rapid demographic decline. This was caused by the simultaneous decline in fertility and a significant decrease in life expectancy, especially for Russian men. The life expectancy of Russian men decreased from 64 in 1989 to 58 in 2001. The fertility rate dropped close to one child per woman in the late 1990s. In 2001, Russian males had two years shorter life expectancy than males in India, a country that was and still is much poorer and less developed. While the life expectancy of men is shorter than that of women pretty much universally, Eastern Europe is an absolute champion in this phenomenon. That is likely caused by the lacking healthcare in combination with certain lifestyle choices popular in the region. But in the post-Soviet period, there was also an exceptionally high suicide rate of Russian men, 
contributing 50,000 deaths in the year 2000 alone. Overall, the post-Soviet years in Russia were truly a disturbing period, in which the state failed to handle some of its basic responsibilities and the population went into a deep dive because of the impacts of overall despair on the well-being of the people. Even today, the life expectancy of Russian men is at the 1960s levels and behind countries like Pakistan or Egypt, which are much poorer. That is also impacted by the death rate of infectious and parasitic diseases, which is more than double that of the EU in Russia. Exceptionally high mortality levels created a phenomenon called the Russian Cross, since the graph showing deaths and births in Russia looked like a cross in the 1990s. From 1992 to 2001, there were 12 million more deaths than births in the Russian Federation. This process was somewhat mitigated by the return of many Russians living in other Soviet republics back to Russia. Overall, the Russian Federation lost 6 million inhabitants between 1992 and 2008. On the other hand, it is fair to acknowledge that the significantly lower life expectancy in Russia is making the problems of aging populations less severe from the point of view of pensions. Since with an average life expectancy being around 70 years, Russia has to pay pensions to people for a significantly shorter amount of time than in the West, where the life expectancy is usually around 80 years or more. Quite an elegant solution. There was a significant uptick in the Russian fertility rates after 2008, when the country stabilized and the high oil prices meant a clear increase in the people's living standards. The fertility rate went from the lowest point of 1.15 children per woman in 1999 to levels around 1.7 children per woman for a couple of years from 2013 to 2016, while the number of live births was getting close to 2 million in those years. After that, it dropped again and now seemed to hover around the 1.5 children per woman mark. The fertility rate for 2022, the year of the invasion, was not yet published, but it will almost certainly be low, since the number of live births went from 1.4 million in 2021 to 1.3 million in 2022. The impacts of the war on fertility can hardly be positive. Overall, while many people were hailing the boost in Russian birth rates in the 2010s, the trend shows no significant reverse taking place, since the number of live births went from almost 2 million in 2014 to 1.3 million in 2022, a drop of staggering 700,000. This is caused partially by the reduction in the number of women of childbearing age, since the smallest cohorts of Russian women born in the late 1990s and early 2000s are now in the childbearing age. This is especially especially concerning for Russia because of some of the specific traits of Russian and overall Eastern European demographics. Women in Russia have children significantly earlier than in the West, usually in their mid-twenties, even though the number is steadily climbing up. The number of childless women is also significantly lower, around 11%, but they often end up having only one child. This contrasts with the situation in the Western Europe, where women are delaying childbirth more and there is a significant proportion of childless women, but those women that do have children usually have more than one. Thus, Russia cannot really count on women in their 20s having children later in their 30s, since, on average, that is not very common in Russia. The decrease in the number of the live births is thus caused both by the reduction in the number of women of childbearing age and their lower fertility levels. All this suggests that the Russian demographic decline will continue and will get even stronger. Since the life expectancy in Russia is 71 years now, the cohorts that will be largely dying off in the 2020s are those born in the 1950s. In the 1950s, almost 3 million Russians were born every year. Around 1.5 million babies were born in Russia in the last couple of years. Even if the current number of live births in Russia remains stable, which it likely won't, it suggests a natural decrease of 1.5 million people yearly if we discount immigration. Most projections thus show the population of the Russian Federation declining to 100 to 125 million throughout this century, with the more pessimistic ones speaking about an even more significant decline. But there is another significant shift taking place in the background. The processes of inner shifts in the ethnic balance of the Soviet Union are now being repeated within the Russian Federation itself. The combination of the loss of many majority non-Russian territories after the fall of the Soviet Union, the immigration of Russians from newly independent republics to Russia, 
and the emigration of ethnic minorities like the Soviet Jews or ethnic Germans to Israel and Germany made Russia ethnically more homogeneous state after the breakup of the Soviet Union. That is being reversed at a breakneck pace. While Russia does not publish or collect statistics on the fertility rate of different ethnic groups, you can deduce that by looking at the fertility rates of oblasts the Russian name for different administrative regions, and their ethnic composition. While in the oblasts, where there are either very few ethnic Russians, or they are a minority, like Chechnya, Tuva, Altai Republic, Buratia, Yakutia, Dagestan, or Ingushetia, the fertility rate is between two and three children per woman. The oblasts there are comprised almost completely of Russians, for example Belgorod Oblast, Ivanovo Oblast, Vladimir Oblast, Voronezh Oblast, Molensk Oblast, or Tula Oblast, the fertility rate is usually around 1.2 children per woman. This points to a very significant fertility gap between ethnic Russians and non-Russians, that is skewing the overall fertility of the Russian Federation. But, on the other hand, it is it is fair to acknowledge that many of the ethnic groups with higher fertility have been living in the Russian state for centuries, for example Tatars, and that it is short-sighted to assume that they will not be loyal to the Russian state since they are significantly Russified. Here I often perceive certain irony in the approach of Westerners that often deny the negative effects of non-Western immigration on their countries while mocking Russia for the change in its ethnic makeup, acknowledging the problematic nature of the process. But then there are the Russian migratory trends which should be concerning for Russians. Russia is a country experiencing simultaneous mass immigration and mass emigration. In the last decade, Russia had a huge positive migration net gain, ranging from 124,000 in 2018 to almost 600,000 in 2017. The largest single immigration source was Ukraine. But apart from that, the Central Asian countries as a whole comprise clear majority as a source of immigration streams to Russia. In most years, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Kyrgyzstan provided about half of all the immigrants to Russia. While having a positive migration rate, there is still very significant emigration out of Russia every year. This emigration has increased incredibly since 2010, with over 4 million people leaving the country every year. While there are no statistics on who is leaving the country, I think it is pretty clear who those people are. You can look at the rising populations of Russians in the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, Czech Republic, Israel or Canada. So. While hundreds of thousands of people from Central Asia of predominantly Muslim faith come in every year, hundreds of thousands of ethnic Russians leave for Western countries. When looking at the Russian community in the Czech Republic, it is clear that those people are mostly younger people and middle class professionals in search of a better life. The 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine has only magnified the migratory trends, with close to a million people leaving Russia, the majority of them young, educated urban people that can easily find work elsewhere. This will significantly affect the Russian job market and overall economic potential and further depress birth rates, since many people that have left are of childbearing age. Hundreds of thousands of Russian men also likely died or will die on the battlefield or be injured in a way that will significantly restrict their application on the job market. On the other hand, several millions of Ukrainian refugees have also departed for Russia, which is something that you do not hear very often in the Western media. The ethnic change within Russia is documented in the Russian census, which includes ethnicity. The proportion of Russians within the Russian Federation dropped from 77.7% in the 2010 census to 71.6% in the 2021 census. That is truly a staggering pace of change. And if it continues, which is more than likely, ethnic Russians will comprise only two-thirds of the population of the Russian Federation in 2030, which is comparable with Sweden today. Ethnic change is thus faster than in any Western European country. The migrants also, as in the West, concentrate in the largest metropolitan areas with the biggest demand for their labor creating the same discontent experience in the western cities. According to the estimates, Moscow is now around 20% Muslim, and you can find many sources showing the dissatisfaction of the natives with this state of things. 
I already mentioned the irony of Westerners denying troubles connected to mass immigration to their countries while mocking Russia for experiencing the same thing. But it is also ironic that Russians are very good at using the troubles caused by immigration in the Western world for their propaganda purposes. They often trumpet themselves as the bastion of Christian conservative values in opposition to the rotten Western world being decomposed by decadent values and immigration. But Russia is dying out fast, is experiencing massive ethnic change with large consequences for its political future and is also the world abortion superpower while having levels of HIV infections comparable with sub-Saharan Africa. A bastion of conservative values indeed. As I have established, Russia is thus experiencing both the negative phenomenon affecting Western Europe and post-communist Europe simultaneously. There is a significant brain drain of the native young people to countries which they deem as more prospective for their futures, as in the case of Central and Eastern Europe, and, at the same time, significant immigration of people of predominantly Muslim descent from post-Soviet Central Asia, region with rapid population growth that is often perceived as the soft Russian underbelly that brings all the known problems with integration as in the West. What these shifts will bring in the future is very hard to predict. While it is true that there are clearly problems with the integration of the newcomers and it creates significant discontent among the natives, Russia also does not suffer from the self-afflicted constraints in integration caused by political correctness and liberal pressures accusing everyone of taking a hard stance on integration from racism. Russian state will be as ruthless in trying to integrate the newcomers as it is when doing everything else. I also have less insight into the inner life of the Russian Federation than I have into the life in Western Europe, since the information about about life in Russia is underpinned by the significant ideological bias of those who present it, both positive and negative. Stance on Russia is a subject of the cultural war in the West, especially in the post-communist Europe. There have been predictions of Russian state collapse and disintegration since the beginning of the war, and none of those have materialized. I am skeptical about such predictions, and I will believe it when I see it. But the demographic projections are almost certain to constrain the potential of Russia as an expensive power in the future, since the number of men in the conscription age will inevitably diminish, and the Russian state will likely face similar troubles integrating the Central Asian nationalities in their military as did the Soviet Union a couple of decades ago. As a person from post-communist Europe, and specifically that part of it that hugely benefited from the disintegration of the Soviet Empire and managed to get significantly wealthier, more secure and freer, I perceive that as a positive development. There are two major narratives in the ideological debate about the causes of the invasion of Ukraine. One says that Russians were pushed to act by the military influence of the United States, getting closer and closer to their borders by meddling in internal Ukrainian affairs and overthrowing the pro-Russian president Yanukovych, while trying to bring Ukraine to NATO. But, while I am not saying that the US foreign policy is blameless and the matter could not have been treated more delicately, I am not really buying this narrative. First, people love to argue with the promised and then broken wow about NATO not moving east of Germany, which was allegedly given to the Soviets when the Eastern Bloc was disintegrating. But this alleged promise, if it exists, was given only verbally and to representatives of the Soviet Union, a state that no longer exists. And everyone with some knowledge of international law knows that verbal promises count for shit. If they want to argue with it for 30 years, they should have gotten it written down. And when we are debating broken deals, there is the Budapest Memorandum, in which Ukraine gave away its nuclear weapons in exchange for territorial guarantees by Russia and the West. So, if we are debating broken deals, it's a draw at best. People upholding this view then often argue with the irresponsibility of increasing the likelihood of nuclear bombs being used and the consequence of potential destruction of the world. But this is also very problematic. First, the idea of many people, especially on the American right, that limited use of nuclear tactic weapons in Ukraine would automatically lead to a nuclear showdown between NATO and Russia is not grounded in reality. NATO has many other ways to react, for example, by further ramping up the military supplies to Ukraine or sinking Russian ships on the world's oceans. These people often argue with the Cold War mentality affecting the establishment's approach towards Russia. Still, this nuclear scare is precisely the remnant of the Cold War mentality. And secondly, you cannot accept the responsibility for other countries using their nukes. If Russia attacks another country, it cannot win the offensive war it started and then uses nukes that is on them and them alone. 
Otherwise, it would create a precedent in which every country with nukes can extort the world by saying, if I do not get what I want, that will threaten my vital interests and I might use nukes. That is absurd. The other narrative says, Russian foreign policy has remained unchanged for the last 500 years. Russians are trying to expand their territory to reach significant geographic boundaries, such as the Polish Gap, the Carpathian Mountains or the Bessarabian Gap to secure its heartland from outside attacks by positioning its military in easily defendable positions. And while I cannot really know, I do not see any real evidence that Russia fundamentally changed its nature and won't act as it always has. It would certainly be foolish to count on that from the point of view of countries that suffered through centuries of Russian subjugation. Thus, even though I do not have any beef with Russian people, I see the negative demographic development within the Russian Federation as a positive factor for the security of the region where I live.